incredibly important message. Um, basically that. You know, on the list of reasons why people eat, I mean, I've gotten to the point where I think that hunger is actually not even the main reason people eat. Uh, you know, stress, um, lack of sleep. Boredom. Boredom. Yeah. Absolutely. So unless, you know, we can do something that addresses all those things, um, there's a, there's a line from a review paper. This review paper came out in 2011 by a researcher named McLean, and it's the best review paper I've ever read. It was called uh, Biology's Response to Dieting, the Impetus for Weight Regain, and basically went through all the mechanisms of these adaptations that happen during fat loss diets and how biology's response is to try to drive you back to your, your previous. And I'm going to butcher the quote, but at the end of the study, he said, basically, the body's systems are comprehensive, redundant, and well-focused on restoring depleted energy reserves. And any attempt or any kind of strategy for weight loss that doesn't attempt to address a broad spectrum of these things is going to fail. And so that's why when people say, well, just do low carb, you won't be hungry. I'm like, yeah, but people don't just eat because they're hungry. So I think really like trying to get outside the box and, and think about these things. And especially when you read some of the literature, I, I recently read a, a systematic review of successful weight loss maintainers, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so they took people who had lost a significant amount of body weight and kept it off for, for, I think it was three years. And they basically asked them questions and tried to identify commonalities. And there were some things that I expected like cognitive restraint, self-monitoring, um, exercise. And then one of the things they said that I found really fascinating was pretty ubiquitous between people. They said, I had to develop a new identity. So are you familiar with Ethan Supley? No. So Ethan is an actor. He's been in like, remember the Titans and uh, American history X. I certainly saw American history X. Yeah. So he was, he was very large. Like he was like 550 pounds and now he's like 230 and jacked. But he was five. He was how? Five hundred and fifty pounds. Um, and he has it. Whenever he puts up posts on his Instagram of him training, it'll say, "I killed my clone today." And I asked him, "Like, is this what you're talking about? Like creating a new identity?" And he said, "This is exactly what I'm talking about because I had to kill who I was because there was no way I was going to be able to make long-term changes if I just didn't become a new person." Because there's, I mean, and addicts talk about this, right? Like um, people for, who are alcoholics, they had to get new friends. They had to hang out at different places because their entire life had been set up around this lifestyle for alcohol. And I would actually argue that eating disorders or disordered eating patterns is much harder to break than other forms of addiction. And think about food addiction. Well, in some ways, bulimia and anorexia are still addictions. You can't stop eating. Like if you're an alcoholic, you can abstain from alcohol. If you become addicted to say cocaine, you can abstain from that. You can never abstain from food. And so now imagine telling a gambling addict, well, you've got to play this slot, you know, a couple times a day, but no more. Like that's, that's really challenging. So, um, yeah, I just like all this stuff. It's so important to be comprehensive with how we treat these things. I, these are incredibly important points. And to my knowledge, I don't think anyone has really described it uh, in a cohesive way, the way that you're doing here. So important for people to understand this because obviously as a neuroscientist, I think, you know, the nervous system is creating our thoughts. Our thoughts are, and feelings are related to psychology. And therefore, of course, our physiology and our psychology are one in the same. It's bi-directional. Now there's nowadays, there's a lot of interest in brain body in particular gut brain uh, access and we, we can talk about that but i i really appreciate that you're spelling out how there are these different variables each one can account for a number of different things exercise clearly has a remarkably potent effect both during the exercise in terms of caloric burn overall health and biomarkers and then um this is wonderful to learn that it can increase the sensitivity to, uh, to satiety signals uh, I think uh, that makes, at least in my mind, places it very high on the list of things that people should absolutely do. But that there are other factors too. Um, and the identity piece 
is fascinating. Um, it reminds me also, your story reminds me also of David Goggins, who is, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, he talks about his former very overweight self, yep. almost as if it was a different person. Yeah. Um, and he uses language that I'm not going to use here. <laughs> um, but, you know, I've I know, met David, know David a bit, and he's, he's every bit as intense and driven as, and a remarkable human being as he appears to be uh, online. He is that guy. Um, but it does seem like he had to more or less kill off a former version of himself and, and continues to do that every day. And I think what your point about the, this other fellow who did, um, does, it, uh, does it through a similar process, I, the word today seems to really matter. It's not like you uh, defeat this former version of yourself and then that, that, per that person is buried and gone. You said, you know, I killed my clone today. And that's the way that David talks about it also. So this is a daily process. And I think um, this is not just a small detail in tying together all these things. I think that what you are describing is, is fundamental because we can pull on each one of these variables and talk about each one of them. But at the end of the day, we're a cohesive whole as, a, as an individual. In, um, sorry, you were about no, to that, say. That gets, that's gets actually into one of my, my favorite topics, which is, you know, why do we have such a hard time with losing weight, but more so keeping it off? Because of obese people, six out of every seven obese people will lose a significant amount of body weight in their life. So why do we still have an obesity problem? They don't keep it off. Why don't they keep it off? When you look at the research, basically what it suggests is because people think about, I'm going to do a diet and I'm gonna lose this weight and they do not give any thought to what happens afterwards, right? It's like, think about if you have some kind of chronic disease or a diabetic, right? You, you can't just take insulin once and that's it, right? You gotta take it continuously, otherwise, you're going to have problems. Um, if you do a diet and you lose, you know, uh, 30 pounds, fantastic. But if you then just go back to all your old habits, it, you're going to go back to where you were, if not more. Uh, you can't, you can't create a new version of yourself while dragging your old habits and behaviors behind you. So what I'll tell people is, because people say, well, I'm doing a carnivore diet or I'm doing this diet or that diet and I'll say that's fine do you see yourself doing that for the rest of your life and if the answer is yes if you if you really believe that that's going to be sustainable for you and plenty of people low carb intermittent fasting whatever they say uh, felt easy you know I could do this forever great what if you're going to lose weight you have to invoke some form of restriction whether it is a nutrient restriction like low carb low fat a time restriction, intermittent fasting, any form of time restricted eating, or calorie restriction, tracking macros, whatever. So you, you, get, you get to pick the form of restriction. So pick the form of restriction that feels the least restrictive to you as an individual, and also do not assume that it will feel the same for everybody else, because I made this mistake, where it's like, I, I track things. And so I, I allow myself to eat a variety of foods, I allow myself to eat some fun foods. Uh, but I track everything and I'm able to modify my body composition and be in good health doing that. Now, it doesn't feel hard for me. You know, part of it's I've just been doing it for so long. But to other people, that's very stressful. They don't want to, they say, well, I'd rather just not eat for, you know, 16 hours. If that feels easy for them, do that. Because the one thing that, there was a couple of meta-analysis on uh, popular diets. And basically what they showed was they were all equally terrible for, for long-term weight loss. But when they stratified them by adherence, and none of them were better for adherence overall, but when they stratified people just according from lowest adherence to best adherence, it was a linear effect on weight loss. So really what it says is, what is the diet that's gonna be easiest for you to adhere to in the long term, and you should probably do that. And people, again, this is where I step back and take the 10,000 foot view. Somebody will say, well, I'm gonna do ketogenic because I want to increase my fat oxidation and I want to do this and they're talking about all these mechanisms and everything and that's great can you do it for the rest of your life right is that is this going to be something sustainable for you and if the answer is no you probably need to rethink what your approach is going to be it's incredibly important message um basically that <laughs> you know if I could yeah. highlight you know if there was a, a version of highlighter boldface and underline in uh in the podcast space, I, I would highlight boldface and underline what you just said. Um, and for those of you that heard it, uh, listen to it twice and then go forward because it's absolutely key.